loves me. Oh yes, yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. Oh, yeah. I mean Z flat, huh? You want okay. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me. Is that true? Thou hast bled and died for me. Will henceforth live for thee. Come on, sing it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. So glad. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells Sing it out of your heart again. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Come on, come on, me. The Bible tells. someone and tell them, you know, Jesus loves you too. Well, <clears throat> well I want to thank uh, Al. That was wonderful. And also, uh, hey, that was neat to come in on the piano too. That was so marvelous. <clears throat> well, now we, we're going to look at St. Paul. <clears throat> I do have hot water here today. <clears throat> we're, now, <clears throat> we're now going to look at St. Paul uh, in, a, in another place where we read St. Paul. <clears throat> One of the last letters that Paul wrote, he wrote from prison, a Roman imprisonment, to a congregation of believers in Philippi. And he uh, loved that church. Remember in Acts 16, we hear about the founding of that church. Paul had been in prison with uh, Silvanus and uh, Luke and Timothy were traveling with him. And that church was begun. Lydia is the first convert in Europe. She was a, a business lady from Tyatira. And Paul uh, went and by the river was preaching the gospel. And, and I love the way Luke puts it. The Holy Spirit opened her heart. And she heard what Paul said. And so the word of God <laughs> sped and it made sense. And she became a believer. And then, of course, that church was founded. The Philippian jailer becomes a part of the founding of that church. Uh, an earthquake occurred in the middle of the night. Acts 16 tells us about it. And uh, the Philippian jailer, realizing the earthquake has, has jarred the main bar that holds prisoners and secures their, their imprisonment because uh, they would be chained to a bar, a center bar. And when the earthquake occurs, he assumes that they're going to escape. And so he's about to kill himself because in Roman uh, law, it's, it, you cannot lose prisoner. And so his own life would probably be forfeited. And so he's about to kill himself. And Paul says, don't hurt yourself. We're all here. And that is uh, such a great moment. It was a great sign of love that this jailer uh, felt. And he came in and uh, he took Paul. He washed his wounds. Paul had been beaten with rods that very day. And then, the and then takes him home. And then the next day, uh, Paul says, I want to be brought to the, uh, the officials because what happened was unjust. And so Paul tells them that. He was a Roman citizen. He has been unjustly treated. And that's an amazing beginning. And then he goes from there they release him. He goes back to the church. The church is founded. And that becomes a very beloved church for Paul, the church at Philippi. From there, he goes on to Thessalonica. And of course, we read the Thessalonian letter today. And then he goes on down to Athens. And then he goes to Corinth. And then he goes to Ephesus. So that's really 
the big journeys of Paul and the role he plays as a, an itinerant teacher. Wow. Then uh, he's imprisoned and ends up imprisoned in Rome because he uh, appealed to Caesar when he was held captive for two years in Thessalonica, in, Thess- in Caesarea. And so he appealed to Caesar just to get out of that imprisonment in Caesarea. And they have the shipwreck, remember, on Malta. That was amazing. And then they end up in Rome. And, they, and that's the end of Paul's uh, traveling ministry because he's imprisoned there for the rest of his career. And he writes uh, some prison letters from there. And, of course, the last letter he wrote uh, is a letter that means a great deal to me, his second letter to Timothy. And that uh, is a letter that I, I just wrote a commentary on that because I love that book, The Last Letter of Paul. But this is the last letter that Paul wrote to a church. And so we're going to look at a chapter in this, in this letter and then make some expositional observations while we're doing it. And at the end, we'll try to observe how, how we, uh, in a sense, how we use our curiosity and raise questions in order to enable a text like this. This is a narrative text, but it's, it's written differently than our, our Lord's teaching text that we saw this morning. It's a text by St. Paul giving advice. It's an advice text. Remember, we, we observe that, that Paul tends to, in the early part of his letters, give his foundation of Christian theology and his prayers for the people at the beginning of the letter. And then the, the end of the letter, he tends to give his ethical advice and his counsel to the church. And so we're getting a letter right now at the end of, of, of the Philippian letter, counsel that he's giving to the church. But it's, it's wonderful because as we receive this letter through the Philippians, it's a, it becomes counsel for us too. So we listen to it as well. Here it is. Let's take a look at the text. We have it printed out for you. It starts out, we are using the new RSV uh, traditional, uh, new, new RSV text. We'll start with verse 4. It, it starts with the rejoice word, that word chara again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, the word here, epikos, means literally gentle or moderate. It means moderate. Some translations translate it patience, but there's a different word for patience. Patience is macrothuma. Thuma is the word for desire. Macro means to take the long view of your desires. And that's the word that's translated patience in the New Testament. So if you have a translation that translates as patience, that's not the best translation. The word is moderation. Let your moderation be known. You know, it's ironic, isn't it? Why would he say moderation? Why not say zeal? Let your zeal be known to everyone or your hard work or your bravery or something like that. Instead, he says, let your moderation be known. This is the last advice of St. Paul from prison himself to a church in a very tough time. Nero is the emperor. This probably happens after the fire of Rome in 64 AD when persecution, irrational persecution, sweeps the Roman world because the Christians were accused of the fire of Rome. They didn't start the fire. Tacitus tells us Nero did. He wanted to burn out the slums so he could build his great golden garden. And yet he had to have somebody to blame for that fire. And so the Christ- isn't this ironic? The first charge against the Christians that brought them to the arena where they were badly persecuted was the charge of arson. They were charged with arson. And we're grateful for the Roman historian Tacitus who says they were not the arsonists, yet that's what they were charged with. So now it's a dangerous time. And here's Paul. You might expect him to say, let your bravery be known. Instead, he says, let your moderation be known. Isn't that something? Let your moderation be known to everyone. And now listen to this. The Lord is nearby. The Lord is alongside. Remember, we saw that before. The Lord is alongside of us. That's what he used before the Thessalonian text. He's alongside of us. So you can be moderate. Sort of like in the Chronicles of Narnia, if you're riding on Aslan's back, what are you worried about? He is alongside of you. Uh, Then why are you worried? And that's the way he starts the final passage in Philippians. Uh, The Lord is nearby. Then again, specific advice. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer 
and supplication. Notice all the prayer vocabulary is going to come together now. By prayer, supplication. Uh, that is the word uh, in, in Hebrew, that is the word pala, which means to think with God. Supplication is usually translated that way. It means to think with God. So by prayer and with thinking with God, with thanksgiving, there's Eucharist, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's a wonderful invitation to pray. And then a, uh, a promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. By the way, the word for surpass is an interesting Greek word. It's hyper, uh, uper, hyper, and then the word for stay, hyper stay, uh, hyper, uh, uh, hyper stand, to stand above. And that's why the RSV decided to translate that surpass. It surpasses, it's hyper, it's above, and it stays above, it holds on. It's not like upomeno, which is hang on, hang under there, which is endurance. This is a, a more triumphant word. It, he says here, it will stay above. It, will, it, it is above everything that you can imagine. So the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and then he uses this simple word, will guard. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is a great verse on prayer that Paul gives there. Then he goes on. Finally, Paul loves this in letters. Sometimes it's a false stop. We think he's going to say, he's going to end the book. In fact, in the third chapter, he started it with finally, but then he thought of a whole bunch more things to say. But here he does say finally again. Finally, beloved. And now it's almost an interesting kind of Paul the poet. He loves to give lists. Paul is a list maker. And if you think some of his lists we don't like, his lists of sins, but then he has lists of spiritual gifts and other things, lists of ministries. Now comes a list. Finally, beloved, whatever is true. See, this is written in the sort of Jewish, uh, the Greek tradition of, of Socrates. Whatever is true. In other words, think about what's true. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. And then enough of those poetic lies. Then he goes with, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise. And I guess he says, now that's enough of a list. Think about those things. And the word logisthi means uh, count them, count them. So if you know, maybe this is where the phrase count your blessings comes from. Count them up. Or if you're a computer, put them in your hard drive. Put these in your hard drive. Hold on to these. Count them. So logisthi is the word. Count on them. So uh, it's, it's a list. And then that piece of, of, of specific advice. Count on them. And then uh, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and you've received, and you've heard, and you've seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is not ashamed to say, I've been a teacher of yours, and these people think very highly of him, remember, so he's going to use a little of that capital that he's built up with the Philippians. And so he then uses that capital to say, what you've learned, the things you've learned from me, if they're valuable now, I want you to, uh, what you've learned and received, and the God of peace will be will be with you. Keep on doing them. Do them. By the way, the word for do is praxis in Greek. It means put them into practice. Put into practice the things that you learned and you received and you heard and what you've seen in me and God of peace will be with you. All right, that's enough advice. He stops his advice at that point. Uh, I don't know if you're relieved or not to have any more lists, but that's, he does it. And, and because he's so highly regarded by the Philippians, they put up with it. You know, you put up with advice from people you really trust and that you really like. And so there he says, put into practice these things, and then that's enough advice. So he stops it. Now, I rejoice in the Lord. Once again, the word joy. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. And now at last, 
that you revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, of course, you have to understand that. Remember the Philippians, that you have to understand the occasion of this letter. The letter is written because this church, this little church in Philippi, sent a young missionary to help Paul in prison. And in Roman prisons, you had to have somebody that watched your back or somebody that would bring eggs to you or bring food to you in a Roman prison. And so Luke played that role. We know that in later in the letter to the second Timothy. But here they sent Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is a young missionary that was sent to help Paul, but he got sick. We know that from the second chapter of this book. He got sick and Paul had to send him back. And so he sent him back with this letter and told them in, that, in this letter that Timothy was coming soon afterward. And so he sent Epaphroditus home because he got sick. And they, imagine how the people in Philippi feel because here the, the one missionary they sent to keep Paul alive in prison, and this is Paul's fatal imprisonment, it's his last imprisonment, and they're trying to keep him alive. And so they send Epaphroditus to be his, his man there and he had to send him back. So now he's going to pay tribute to this young man. And he says, uh, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul was in prison, you know, for two years in Caesarea. Uh, you can read about that in the book of Acts. And then he appealed to Rome, got sent by ship. Malta ends up in Rome. So they had no way of helping him. But the minute the Philippians discovered he was in Rome and in a Roman imprisonment, they sent Epaphroditus. Okay, is that we all together? That's the, the reason of that section. You had no opportunity. And then he then goes on to say, but not that I am referring to being uh, in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I have to do a word study with you right now on the word content, because it is really a major word that Paul uses. It's not used, uh, use, uh, it's not used in a great number of times in the, uh, in the New Testament, but it's the word auto. If you see a Greek word that has auto at the beginning, it means myself. But it's auto attached to the word archeo, and archeo means health or self-sufficiency. So it's auto-sufficiency. I, I am okay. The RSV decided to translate it content. But what you need to know, what you wouldn't know from just the word content, it really is a first century Greek word for sanity. I am sane, see? I am auto, myself, is okay. Myself is healthy. That's what he's saying. And that's the way you would describe your sanity in the first century. My auto, auto, a caro, my self is healthy. And he is saying that. He's not saying I'm sick or I'm in bad trouble. My self, auto, healthy. I'm healthy. And there he is. So I'm going to translate it this way. I, I know how to, uh, he says, I, I'm, I've learned to be Healthy, myself, sane. I have kept my sanity. Do you like that? I like it. And it's St. Paul. Uh, he doesn't want them to be worried about him. I've kept my sanity. What's the thing you worry about? A person who's in an imprisonment. You worry about them losing their sanity because they're being tortured or maybe they're having bad things happening to them. What's the bad thing about persecution? You can you lose your sanity if you're being persecuted a lot. And Paul wants to assure them, I am not losing my mind. My mind is healthy. Auto, a carol, I'm healthy. My auto is healthy. All right, I'm sane. I'm keeping, keeping my sanity. And then he, so he says, I, now that I referred to being in need, for I have learned to be content. Okay, add, right, if you've got your own text, you can circle it and say, I've learned to be sane with whatever I have. I know what it is to have a little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and going hungry, in having plenty and of being in need. And then comes one of the most famous lines in St. Paul. I can do all things 
through him who strengthens me. By the way, the word do there is a simple word that means I can take in stride. I can take or I can do. I can handle. I can take in stride everything that's happening to me. Now, the word that intrigues me the most that I want to spend time on in a minute is the word secret. I have noticed how everything in the text so far is getting you ready for a great word. Uh, he's helping them with advice, and now he's comforting them with the fact that he's not lost his sanity. What's the huge question that's going to be raised by everyone? Well, how have you kept your sanity? See, I've learned the secret of keeping my sanity. Notice, see, I've learned the secret of being well-fed, going hungry, of having plenty and being in need. The King James Bible used to say, being abased and abounding. Being abased, made fun of, being deprived, and also being well-fed. I can take them both. I've learned the secret. By the way, that word for secret there is very interesting. Moffat's translation, he was quite intrigued by that word. And it means that it's used in the first century to refer to initiation secrets in, in movements in the first century world, to be ushered into a secret, to know a secret. It's caught my attention that I have learned the secret. I have been ushered into the secret, or Moffat translates it, the, I've been initiated into the secret. I know the secret of keeping my sanity. I know the secret of that. And so then he then says, I can take, all, I can take in stride all these things uh, because of Christ uh, who strengthens me. All right. In any case, it was kind of you, though, to share my distress. By the way, the word for distress is just the word flixus. It, it's a common word. It means sometimes translated affliction, sometimes translated tribulation in the Bible. But it's just the word st distress. The stress. I have taken stress. And believe me, there's stress if there's been a fire in Rome and the Christians are being accused of it. In fact, in the, flip, in the letter to Timothy, he says, twice I was spared from the lions. Thank God. They were throwing the Christians to the lions. That's what they were doing. Nero was doing that during that time, uh, char charging them with arson. So I've been under stress, but I have been able to handle it. And in any case, it was very kind of you to share in my distress, in my stress. Now, then he then gives them history. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, that's their province, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. In other words, they're the only church, evidently, that sort of stayed tied in with Paul in the rest of his journeys. Okay? For even when I was in Thessalonica, which is a rich city compared to Philippi, when I was in Thessalonica, that's the capital city of the Roman province. So it's a major city. And there were wonderful Christians there that he met. But he says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Then comes a beautiful part. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been, listen to this, if you're writing a thank you note for somebody giving you a gift, look at this as the thank you note. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. Have you ever written that? Or do you put an envelope in a return envelope where they can send to the next offering? Wouldn't it be nice to get a thank you note where someone says you've given enough? I'm full. I don't need anything more. Thanks. By the way, this, you're going to see that Paul's going to give to the Philippians a clean thank you. You know, families need that. Kids need to have a clean thank you. Like if a kid writes a letter to his grandmother and the grandmother says, hey, thanks for writing that letter. And by the way, you misspelled four words. Don't do that. Just say, thank you for that letter. I needed that letter. Don't correct. Don't add something else. That's, that's sort of subtraction by addition. The minute you add something, you subtract from it. Don't do it. Try out the ability to give a clean thank you to people with no hook. No hook whatsoever. Notice he doesn't say, and by the way, in your next love package, I would like to have some cigars because uh, they don't have any of those here. Uh, he doesn't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. But I put that in because Bonhoeffer did write that in his letters from prison. I need some cigars. He did write that to his parents. That's all right. He earned the right to say that. But 
So even when I was in Thessalonica, you helped me with my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift. I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I've been paid in full and have more than enough. Notice he's not finished. I'm fully satisfied, fully satisfied uh, that I've received from Epaphroditus. He mentions the young man now. The gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And then he even adds another P.S. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's the end of the book, except he adds one footnote. Paul says in all the letters, I write a final greeting with my own hand. And so he evidently does that here, too. We know that from other letters. He said, I write a final greeting. But don't you love that clean thank you? Thanks. You have made my day. And Epaphroditus did it. See, they're wondering if Epaphroditus was a bad missionary. After all, he got sick and didn't even finish his job. And yet Paul is so honoring him here. He brought the gift. I'm so grateful. Period. Now, here, then he takes the pen in his own hand and writes the final greeting. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, and especially those in Caesar's household. <laughs> What's the matter, Caesar? Can't you keep Paul under control? He's right there in the prison. Everybody wonders, did Seneca ever visit Paul, the great philosopher? Because, you know, Gallio was his trial judge in Corinth and set Paul free. Did you know that Gallio in Corinthians is the brother of the great philosopher Seneca? But we have no one knows. There's no record of Seneca meeting Paul. But in Caesar's household, he's winning guards to Christ. There's no question. Otherwise, he couldn't say this. Those send greetings, especially those in Caesar's household. All right. And then the last lines of St. Paul, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right, I want to spend the rest of my time today looking at one big word and trying to figure it out from this text. Looking at this text, I want to ask a question. I really believe in exposition of Paul. One of the best things you can do with Paul, just like we did with our Lord's teaching, is to ask questions. Be curious. Ask questions and see if the text itself will help you understand uh, the question that might logically come because of the way the sentence builds. I think I pretty well made the case for you that the sentences build toward the word secret. I have learned the secret because that is a mysterious word. And everybody is interested in secrets, sometimes in a bad way. If I had a secret that nobody else had, then I, that's the, the source of cultism. A lot of cultic movements are built around having a secret that nobody else knows. That's Gnosticism. They had a secret that nobody else knew. And they pay $300 and come to the hotel and we'll teach you that secret. The cultic movements have always uh, thrived on that. And so there's no question that chapter four builds throughout the chapter, advice he gives, first opening counsel, the invitation to pray, then the advice, and then... Uh, this wonderful section about not that I complain of want, I have learned to keep my sanity, okay, because I've learned the secret of facing plenty and want. I've learned the secret of keeping my sanity. I've learned that secret. What is the secret, St. Paul? Well, I'm going to dare to take this text and interpret it that way. I'm going to see five marks of his secret that he shares to get you ready for that great line. The first mark of Paul's secret is that he stays close to the Lord. Notice, that's the way the whole passage begins. It begins with joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone know your moderation, which is going to be the secret. Remember, that is the secret, is his moderation. He's not a fanatic. Paul is not a fanatic. He's kept his sanity. Fanatics lose their sanity. When they take delight in murdering people and beheading them and stuff like that, that's to lose your sanity. Paul did not lose his sanity. He has stayed a moderate. He has kept mellow. And notice, that's at the very beginning. How did he do it? First, he has stayed close to the Lord. 
I remember when I went off to Princeton Seminary, uh, everybody was worried I might turn liberal. And I uh, had fortunately had a great mentor in Richard Halverson, who was the associate pastor at the Hollywood Presbyterian Church. And he took a whole group of us with Miss Mears in her cabin at Forest Home. We were all going to go off to seminary. Some of us are going to Fuller, some are going to Princeton. I was going to Princeton, a bunch of us. And he said, when you go, and Dick had gone to Princeton, so he particularly zeroed in on me. He says, when you go to Princeton Seminary, I want you to do two things. I want you to get a network of guys that you can pray with that'll be a support network for you. And, I, therefore, and with that, with those guys and all, I want you to stay close to Jesus Christ. And then I want to open your eyes and learn everything you can learn. And, ha- and I had a Renaissance experience when I was in seminary. The whole world opened up to me. That's where I discovered C.S. Lewis, where I discovered Karl Barth. I discovered it, it just came in. But the two things he said, stay close to Jesus Christ, have a circle of friends that are praying with you too, and, the, and together stay close to Jesus Christ. And we did that at prison. And I've always said one of the great things about going to seminary is you can make lifelong friends. And we did it. One of my lifelong friends, his book is out there on the, on the table, Dale Bruner, who's my more brilliant lifelong friend. But he wrote a great commentary on John's gospel. It's out there. He was in that group. We had a group. We stayed together. We prayed together. And we stayed close to Jesus Christ. Tried to stay close to Jesus Christ. And notice, that's what Paul is, that's a secret. Notice it's coming out there in the very opening. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone know your moderation. The Lord is nearby. The Lord is alongside of you. What are you frightened of? He's alongside. He's your companion. And notice how that just governs everything from then on. So that's his first secret. Secondly, it made him unflappable. Paul is kind of unflappable. And that's what a moderate is. Instead of being scattered or being fan- fan- becoming fanatic, he is unflappable because of that relationship, that, that relationship with Jesus Christ. Secondly, he uh, prays a lot. It's interesting, the very first piece of advice is to pray. He says, don't be worried about anything, but with prayer, and he uses three kinds of prayer. Prayer, supplication, that means thinking with God, and thanksgiving. Let your requests, anything, even things off the wall, like scores of games, go ahead and pray for your team. It doesn't make any difference. God is going to do what he wants to do anyway as far as how he answers your prayer. But you have a right to bring your prayer to the Lord. So he says, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Let your requests. He doesn't say let some of your requests or approved requests. Be sure your requests honor God. No, just make a request. Tell him what's on your heart. Remember, he said he wanted to take you into his confidence. Take him into your confidence. Tell him what's on your heart. What is it you want? Let him discipline it, but bring it to him. And notice, that's what Paul does. He says, he urges us to pray, and he does it himself. Notice, he brings that up right away. Uh, Let your requests be made known. and the peace of God then, will, which surpasses knowledge, will guard you. That will guard you. So, first, he stays close to Christ. Secondly, he prays a lot. And third, here we get a curious passage. Have you ever thought of this list? The famous list of Paul in Philippians. If there is, if there is, if there is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is. You know what he's doing? He's giving you a thumbnail Description of the Jewish, Judeo-Christian tradition of meditation. He's teaching you how to meditate. It's not in the meditation tradition of the empty room. In fact, our Lord argued against that. Don't have an empty room because if you leave the room empty, then devils will come in when you're not watching. Instead, the, the Christian tradition of meditation is not the empty room, but the focused mind. Focus on great truths. You want to meditate? Meditate on the faithfulness of God. Meditate on his kindness. Meditate on what he's shown of his faithfulness to you. Meditate on that. Focus on that. In fact, he even says it. Logistai. Count those. Count your blessings. Count all those things. Keep track of those things and then practice the things you've learned. 
But that's the meditation tradition, which I call the Judeo-Christian meditation tradition. It's not the tradition of the empty room or of a mantra that, where you just have an empty mantra that you just repeat something over and over again and hum. No, no, it's not that. It's focusing. It's focusing on the great truths of God. It's almost like the Psalm, Psalm 103. Blessed be the Lord. You know, I bless the Lord, O my soul, and I consciously remember how great is his love and faithfulness. From, I can't get away from it. Whether in heaven or hell, I can't get away from it. It's there. I trust it. Okay, the focusing on the great truths. You know, I have a friend who's here at this meeting today, Paul Lang. I think he had to leave because he had to go to a meeting. He's a professor of, uh, of urology. Paul, are you here still? He asked the very tough question about, oh, he, he asked the question about uh, uh, this morning, uh, one of the tough questions about uh, uh, what we do with uh, literary criticism and criticism of text. And he's, a, one of, he's in a prayer group with me and I love that guy. He's professor of urology at the University of Washington. And he told me a story once of taking on a grand round his young surgeon, because he was chairman of the department at the University of Washington. And I, he said, I took a group of students around. And then I, uh, in the grand rounds, I gave them sort of uh, my own philosophy of, of, of medicine, a little bit his own interpretation of the Hippocratic Oath. And he says the mandate for a doctor, and Paul shared this, is to heal, it's to care, it's to teach, because they were in a teaching hospital at the University of Washington, and I love his fourth word, and it's to wonder. It's to wonder. Some of the best diagnosis happens when a doctor wonders. I wonder. I wonder about that. I'll repeat that again. That's from Paul Lang. What is the mandate of medicine? It's first to heal. Make no mistake of that. Then to care. That's love. Care. Then to teach. Because the doctor in a medical hospital like University of Washington has to be a teacher. And then to wonder. That's the meditation tradition that we have here, right here. Paul is saying that. He says, think about all these things, wonder about them, and then do them. Fourth, he handles both advantages and disadvantages in his life. That's part of his secret. His secret is that I can handle the advantages and the disadvantages. And uh, Pascal has a great line one of my favorite. In fact, I carved this on driftwood and it's in my study downstairs. I have a little Bible study group that meets there, my theological dialogue group, and that big piece of driftwood is on top of our fireplace because I had to have a huge piece of driftwood to I carve inscriptions of famous people on driftwood in the summer. And sometimes by commission, people will give me a commission and say, would you carve uh, this for me? But this is my own that I love. It's from Pascal. Do great things as though they were small because of Jesus Christ. Do small things as though they were great because of Jesus Christ. Paul, in a sense, is unflappable because he's got that secret. He can handle disappointments and he can handle, and I know how to be poor, he said. I, I've been in several imprisonments, some of the worst prisons, by the way. And I've been, I know how to be treated well. Paul was an aristocrat, you know. He really was. And we're grateful for that because in, in the, uh, when he was in Jerusalem and tried to address the crowd because they accused him of bringing a Greek in the temple, he had brought Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him. And the rumor was spread that Paul took this Greek into the temple and so a riot broke out. And he asked to address the crowd. <laughs> and he tried to address them. And he, and he addressed them first in Hebrew, which shows they ordinarily would hear it in Greek. But he addressed them in Hebrew, and they got very quiet. And in the Hebrew, he said, you know, the, the gospel is to go to the whole world as well as to the Jews. And then the riot really broke out. And the Roman legate, a man named uh, Julius, rescued him from the riot. And, and so he wasn't killed. But then he had to go meet the high priest and he got in trouble with that and all. And he heard that a, a, a group of marauders, this is in the book of Acts, a group of marauders were going to assassinate him when he was being transported to meet the high priest. 
and he heard about that assassination plot. Guess what? Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. He didn't buy his Roman citizenship. He had it by birth. He was from Tarsus, from a very wealthy family. He tells his nephew to go to his sister in Jerusalem to tell the legate that this assassination plot is underway. And the legate hears about this assassination plot from Paul's wealthy sister, who tells him that. And then the, the legate, with 100 soldiers, takes Paul and brings him down to Caesarea, where unfortunately then he stayed in prison for two years, but saved his life. Now, you have to have some aristocratic clout to get a Roman legate to save your life with 100 Roman soldiers with full horseback to take Paul down to Caesarea. And that's right there in the book of Acts. He was rich. He had wealth. And so that wealth helped him there. And also he was very brilliant and knew languages very well. That helped him. And he knew philosophy very well. He quotes the philosophers in his great sermon on Mars Hill. Uh, I mean, yeah, in, in Athens. So he's very, very smart. So all these things are in his favor. But a lot of things were against him, like his imprisonments. He was in prison right and left. He was beaten with rods at Philippi, almost killed by that. He was stoned in Lystra, almost killed, except the Christians drug him out of the city and protected him. Thank God for that. We wouldn't have had any of the letters then if they hadn't drug him out of Lystra and saved his life. And then he's imprisoned in Rome, and he ends his life there. So he's had lots of disadvantages. But where would he have written his prison epistles if he hadn't been in prison? He wrote his letters from prison and some of his greatest ones, the Ephesian letter, the Philippian letter. He wrote it from prison, the Colossian letter, and 2 Timothy. He wrote from prison. It's funny. Paul uses his advantages and he uses his disadvantages. When he was in Ephesus, he was there two and a half years and he wanted to teach because Paul loves to teach. It's a very wealthy city and a wonderful city that he wanted to teach at, but he couldn't get any place to teach. So he finally found a place he could rent called Tyranius Hall. And do you know the archaeologists have been spending years to try to find Tyranius Hall. They would love it if they could find Tyranius Hall because Paul for two years taught, two and a half years, taught in Tyranius Hall. It was a hall that they could rent. And he taught, get this, from three in the afternoon until six in the evening. If you've been in the Middle East and know how hot it is at three o'clock in the afternoon, you tell me anybody in their right mind is going to go to class at three o'clock in the afternoon. And yet that's the only time he could rent it. Look, at we were lucky to rent this beautiful place. By the way, when we rented this, this was the only day. That's why we made a reservation here nine months ago to get the only day that was free at Upper Gwyn because I wanted Upper Gwyn. But Paul wanted, he, he, he wanted to be in Tyrannius Hall. It was the only hall he could rent. And the only time he could rent it was three o'clock in the afternoon until six o'clock in the evening. What a terrible time to rent it. Except, guess who can come at that time? Slaves can come and hear Paul because that's when they're off work. They have to be at their families in the morning. They have to be at their houses in the evening. They get free time in the middle of the afternoon when nobody wants to do anything. And guess what Paul had great success with? He had great success teaching slaves. And I want to ask you a question that probably you don't know the answer to unless I tell you. Who are the intellectuals of the first century world? Were they the aristocrats? They were the slaves. Slaves were the teachers of all the youth. Many of those slaves had been captured on ships by, by uh, uh, pirates and then turned into slavery. And they were well educated. And they, you can read story after story. Read Will Durant, the story of ancient Greece. It's the slaves who did all the teaching. And the slaves are the intellectuals. They're the future and guess who Paul got to invest his life in? Did you know in the book of Romans, the last chapter, all that list of names? Did you know that of that list of names, almost a fourth of the names are slave names? Paul hasn't even been to Rome yet. He knows all these people that have been with him in Ephesus, and now they've been transported by owners and taken to different places, and he knows their names, and he addresses them by name. When did that happen? Because of the discipline. By the way, you have a disadvantage with your church and you can't have a meeting at a certain time, then 
Take the time you can make and be innovative with it. Be clever with it. Use the, use the disadvantage to your advantage. And that's what Paul did at Ephesus. So he says, I can take, I know how to have advantages. I know how to have disadvantages in any and all things. I have kept my sanity in the midst of all this and I can do them all because I have my stride in Jesus Christ. I've kept my stride. He has kept his stride. And then finally, he has friends. He has friends who watch his back and he thanks them. And you heard that beautifully, that simple thanks to all these friends. I have friends who I watch, who watch over for me. And then finally, there's a sixth. I have a sixth that I add on. And that is he enjoys it all. He starts it and he almost ends it with rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And again, I rejoice that you remembered me and sent Epaphroditus to help me. And now at the end, I'm filled to, I'm overflowed with the gift you gave me. Notice joy, joy, joy. Somehow in the middle of it all, he's having fun. Are you having fun? It's really wonderful. That's the, uh, G.K. Chesterton called joy the gigantic secret of the Christian. It's a gigantic secret, joy. And it's good, and it comes out of God's grace, and that is the joy of walking in faith that Paul has. So what I decided to do expositionally for this, and I'm going to stop now so that my, uh, my I have a, 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 I have a, 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 a reviewer for this talk too. By the way, I want to tell you that we originally had invited Renee Notkin to be our reviewer of, the, of this talk, and she agreed. She was, we had her on our first program and everything, and she was so excited to come. But uh, today is the memorial service for Steve Hayner in Atlanta, Georgia. And what a great man uh, Steve Hayner has been in his whole ministry and his life. And so even uh, probably it's over by now because it's late in, the, late in the evening there now. But today they had a service in Atlanta and I'm sure a huge crowd of people, a great number of people from here went. And Renee went and James B. went and Kay Brolite, who was supposed to be here, also went to that. I told him that's where you've got to go. So we didn't replace Renee for uh, this time. So Doug Bunnell is on his own to give the review, uh, his review. Uh, but we still have one more secret for you, and that is that uh, I not only believe in exposition of the text, I believe that music should be expositionally too, should be expositional. So at the very end of our time today, uh, Steve Newby is going to tell us how he wrote a song and the exposition of the song, and we get to hear one more great Steve Newby song before we end. But right now, uh, Doug uh, gets to come up and be my, uh, my mentor. One of my special friends is this young man, and uh, he is going to re reflect on exposition of Philippians 4. As I come up and um, stand here and just thinking how to respond, I want to start just um, with a clean thank you, Earl, <laughs> to you. A clean thank you for being our teacher today. It has been a rich and just incredibly joyful time. So if I can offer my voice for all of our, all of our voices, a clean thank you. Um, Frederick Beekner says that there are two sermons on any given day. And one is the sermon, the spirit is speaking through the preacher. And the second is the sermon, the spirit is speaking to those of us listening. Um, so I want to give some of my response time to that still small voice. And I just want to take a few minutes and I want us just to pay attention to what themes, what ideas, what words are ringing. What, what's, what's some of our take homes? Where are the places the spirit is speaking to us? So let's just take a few minutes and pay attention right now to where the spirit is speaking in our own lives and our own hearts and do it in your own meditation style that you have learned that the spirit is speaking. Let's take that time.
Try and God, we thank you that you speak, that you have given us, given us ears to hear. Let us continue to pay attention to what you are saying to the church. In the name of the one who called you, Abba Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. My second response is I feel like I have been, um, just had a, a glimpse into some of the majesty. Um, and as the Spirit has been speaking and pointing me to the majesty of Scripture, to the depth of his word, um, I have felt, and this might be part of my tradition speaking, I have felt the call to confess. So I want to just give us a chance to pray a confession a prayer, acknowledging the God we worship is a God of grace. We have heard of a God of grace. We have heard through Scripture of a God who is quick to forgive, a God who says that as far as the East is from the West, so far will he remove our sins and transgressions from us. But let me invite us into a time of confession as we respond. Would you join me in prayer? O oh Lord, our Lord, we have sensed and been given a glimpse of the depth of your word, of the power of your word. We have seen a picture of what it means to be rooted, to be like the tree planted by the streams, the tree that grows strong and tall because of the nourishment, because of the scripture, because of your word. And Lord, as we respond to that, I feel in the depth of my soul the many places where I have taken your word for granted, where I have not appreciated the power, where I have leaned on other things, where I have thought that change could come about, where I have trusted my own words above your word. And so, Lord, we pray our confession for the ways we have not lifted up your word, for the times we have trusted in that which is not you. And for the times, Lord, where we have not been able to ask the right questions, we have not been able to give the time, and we have missed at times, Lord, the essence of your word. I confess, Lord, the sermons I have preached that have not gotten smallpox from the text. I confess the places and the times where I have not stood under the authority of your word. So Lord, in this moment, hear our confession. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. One of the other good parts of our tradition is we acknowledge that the word is very clear. There is nothing we can do that can separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are all forgiven, and we are being made whole. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. And so, Earl, I want to go back to the six questions, the five questions you asked of the text. I thought they were so insightful to establish the text, to establish the beginnings, the endings, the parameters, the sense of the text, to ask the historical questions, to use the tools that we have, to third, ask the questions, what do the words say? What do the words mean? Um, fourth, to ask those questions, how would the first century hear those, how would they hear that message? How would that message be heard? And fifth, to ask that question, what does this text say to me? And, and if I could offer, I want to throw in my sixth question, which I learned from my children. And the sixth question, which they would come to me, and I, it's the one that I bring to the sermon. At this point, when we thought through and we've had a very full day of God's word, the sixth question they would bring to me was, so what? The middle school question, so what? And Earl, if I could invite you back up, I would like to ask that question. I'm going to buy what you say. I'm going to buy the. Ta I'm going to buy this case for expo expositional teaching. I'm going to buy that that God's word can change lives, can transform communities, can do revival in the church. I, I'm going to buy that the word has power. 
Um, what does tomorrow look like for me? I want to ask that question. Um, so what? What would this look like in the life as we walk out to say, okay, this, the case has been made. I want to respond. If I could ask Earl, what would be, um, maybe just to start off, what would be some of the habits? What would be the practices? What would be the disciplines of one who were to take the exposition of Scripture as seriously, the gravitas that you have given us? What would be some disciplines and some habits that we would bring to be those people of, of joy, to be those people of God's Word? What would be some that you would offer to us? Well, uh, I, two things came to my mind. One is something we do. The other is something we trust. Uh, I think it's very important uh, uh, to start with the trust. We need to trust that the text of these marvelous texts that you just alluded to, these texts will be validated given time. And I have to, to believe that. And, and therefore, what I do then is I'm going to have to be willing to take the time. Take the time that it takes. Uh, I always think it's so important in relating to people to realize that no one's story is over. Everyone is mid-story. St. Paul is treating everybody that way in all of his letters. In fact, I was so struck with that in 2 Timothy. He has the, one of the bleakest portrayals for Timothy of the condition of the Roman world when he writes that letter, because it's just before Paul gets himself thrown to the lions. And he, it's very bleak, and he has this very bad. And then he says at the end of it, I expect him to say, well, now that is bad, but, well, we just look forward to heaven, and that's where it'll be. Instead, he says, no, as for you, preach the word in season, out of season. He is it. When it's good, when it's bad. In season, out of season. And then, he, remember I told you the word for patience is, see, now I'm filled with all the words from 2 Timothy, because I just wrote the commentary on 2 Timothy. And the, you, the word macrothuma is the word patience. And so Paul then says to Timothy, and I want you to do it patiently. But he doesn't say patiently. And the RSV has a tough time translating it. He says, hyper macro thuma, hyper patience, which means, and so the RSV translates it with exceeding patience. <laughs> but it's, I wish they put hyper, hyper patience. In other words, trust. And he says to Timothy, take the long view. No one is a finished product. Everybody is midstream. Treat everybody that way. Uh, treat people as if you're going to know them the rest of your life. And it, uh, now be faithful to the text. And now that would be the thing. Trust that the text will be validated. Trust it with your kids. Trust it with people that are now in doubt. Trust that, uh, and then do your best to just try to be a witness. But trust the text and trust the truth. It's really the truth. Trusting the truth to make its own mark. And then I think as far as what you do, I do agree, you have to work. If you're gonna, if you're gonna try to in, uh, unfold these texts, I think you owe it to the text. Uh, I love the joke someone said. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I don't, I don't even study during the week. I just go on Sunday morning and say, Lord, what do you want me to preach to the people? I had a pastor actually say this to a group of young seminarians that I got together once, and I was horrified because this guy <laughs> said, I don't even study. I used to study. I don't do it now. I just live with the people, serve the people, care about the people all week. I wondered about some of that because I know he loved to play golf and things like that. All right. But I love to be with the people. And then on Sunday morning, I just say, Lord, whatever word you have for me, I'm going to preach it. And I said, to, I, I decided to be devil's advocate or really maybe angel's advocate. But I said, have you ever had a morning where the Lord said, sit down you have nothing to say. <laughs> what if the Lord said that some morning? You know, have mercy. Have mercy. No, I didn't. I didn't actually do that. I said, what if he said you're not prepared? But you're not prepared. The, the, the text deserves uh, you and me, whether, whatever you're doing. Whenever I'm getting ready to, to teach a text or to share a text, uh, I, I owe it to the text to be prepared, to have read it as carefully as I can read it, to try to understand it and to, to be inquisitive, you know, do all these things I'm telling about, be as curious as you can be and do it. But I think I owe it to the text. 
It's just like Gershwin deserves. I, by the way, I love Gershwin. And I got some, I bought a whole bunch of Gershwin music because I played the piano a little bit. And I looked at it. Bess, you is my woman now. And Porgy. And I, do you realize that Gershwin wrote all the music in chords, not single notes. And I, I caught about, I didn't even get one measure into it. It was so difficult. And so I said to my friend Vicky Sagata, who's a doctor and also a classical pianist, I said, Vicky, can I ask you one question? If I gave you that Gershwin music, can you sit down and play it? And she's very modest, but very sheepish. I should ask this of Steve Newby. And she said, yeah, I can. You can? Why? Because she's worked so hard. She's worked so hard with music. She can sit down and play all those chords. You try it. I can't. And I love to play pianos, more or less. But I can play tiptoe through the tulips and stuff like that. But I can't play Gershwin. I can't do it. Um, I can't, I just can't do it. Uh, if I studied a long time, maybe I could. And in a way, I owe it to Gershwin, if I'm going to play Gershwin, that I'm going to really try to understand it. And I think we owe it to the text, to really study the text as best you can. And then thank God for the people that can play Gershwin. And I am grateful that some people can play him. Uh, well, can I ask a question? Because I loved there was a There was a service once where you preached. It was for Dr. Munger's memorial service at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley. Do you remember that? And you didn't preach. It, it was about two hours and 15 minutes before you got up to preach. Nine Presbyterian pastors. Woo! <laughs> Everyone talked a lot. And But I remember that service that people said, Dr. Munger woke up in the morning, he studied, and he prayed, and he did his church work in the afternoon. And I remember that lit something in me that I thought, I want to live that way. I want to, that seems like a way to give the text that weight, to give the text that trust. And I know Dr. Munger did that in an amazing way. How did you make time? Because you were a senior pastor. There were, there were lots of demands on your time. How did you make time? For the word, how how did you make time for study, for prayer, for those questions, for what we've been talking about? How did you build that into just the daily time? Well, I, I didn't do it daily. Uh, I aimed at. I I like to have. I'm a kind of a traditionalist. I got a lot of that from my dad. My dad did the same things. He, my dad always had to have beer at five o'clock in the afternoon. I don't care where we were, he had to have beer. And you know, I'm that way too now. I have a beer every day at five. I got it from my dad, but I don't drink a whole bottle though. I just drink a half and then <laughs> cap it and have the next half the next day. But my, I got that from my dad. I, my dad did everything, and I, I'm that way. I love traditions. And so everybody knows I love to study the. Uh, on the Thursday mornings, Thursday mornings. I, and, and I did it. And then Thursday afternoon I studied. And Friday was always my big study day where I did all kinds of other stuff. And people said, when did you write books? I wrote them on Fridays. But not on Thursday. Thursday, I owe it to the church to be ready for the church or for Young Life, if I'm going to speak in the Young Life meeting. And that, I would have to study for three weeks for that. But I, but I would, And I'm always working on the text and always working on what I'm going to speak on and but I would I do it in these segments and 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 I find times that I like to do it and so I like to listen to music I listen to music be careful with earphones because you can ruin your hearing with earphones but I have some gentle earphones I like to listen to music and study on Thursday mornings when I'm a regular pastor now I'm hey I'm not a regular pastor now I can just do whatever I want but I would go for that you know those things Thanks, Doug. Real quickly, this is our last chance for any of the questions that, that you have. And who has a question? Right over here. Oh, and you need to stand up. I'm sorry. I, could you just speak briefly on what some things you've learned or best practices that you have on just learning to tell stories well, whether they be from Scripture or your own life or from books that you've read, just uh, the art of telling a good story? Wow, the art of telling a good story. Uh, I've been told that I can tell good stories. Uh, I love stories. First of all, I love stories. I love Mark Twain. He's my favorite author. And I love C.S. Lewis because he's very short sentences, but he's a great storyteller. Uh, and I, I like stories, but I like the key is to research the story. 
so that there are no inaccuracies in the story. Don't have a story with, with in, inaccuracies so that you, there's accuracy quotient. Like, especially with youth. Don't tell them a boy. Be careful if you tell a sports story and have inaccuracies in a sports story. Don't do it. And uh, then you, but when you're telling a story, you want to get into the life of the story. And I always said, I'll give you this with regard to preaching. I always said, research your illustrations like you research your text. And make this your rule of thumb in preaching. When I've taught preaching classes, I said, make your illustrations short but long. In other words, let the story really have its mark, but make it short, I mean, few, few but long. And the same thing with quotations. When I quote from Bart or anybody else, I want to have his book present usually. I didn't do that here today because I just gave you a few things from my head. But I want to have the book present, but I want to, if I'm going to quote somebody, I want to research the quote so that I fairly put it into context. And I want to do the same thing with the story. Put the story into context as best I can. And then I want to embellish it a little bit. Like I, my story about the estate going to the estate of William Randolph first. I've been to that estate, but I made fun. I made fun. I had fun with it. The alabaster vase. I've had all kinds of people that have said, you know, I've told that story before. And they said, we loved the alabaster vase with the daffodil as a sort of an understated touch. In this lavish home, that's understated. And I had people that they like that kind of humor. Under, I, I said understated. It's not understated. This is lavish. But I do those little touches, you know, when I'm telling a story to make it funny, if I can, and humorous, uh, but yet not obvious. You know what I mean? And it's a little bit... But uh, Mark Twain's a great storyteller. Watch him unfold a story. And so he's a, you, can learn from, you can learn from great storytellers a little bit. Watch how they make, get their character to where you like the character. You've got to like characters in a story, you know. And so you, you just have to do it. But, and hopefully it becomes a window to the text, a window to the point rather than a, a distraction. Next question, back here. Yeah, what's important about the human vessel that brings the exposition? That is, what's the posture, the passion, the heart? Why didn't God just send recordings, you know? I mean, why is it important that you are there giving this message about you? What's it, what's it about you that you bring? Well, I am so grateful that that, uh, again, I love the Karl Barth quote that I gave you earlier, where he said, for the Holy Spirit is not too small a thing to have such forms as we ordinary people. And that's right after he has described the church. And here's how Barth describes the church. The church goes through history in understanding and in misunderstanding, in obedience and disobedience, before the lofty good that God has given us, the gospel. So, And then he says, and yet... It's, it's not too small a thing for the Holy Spirit to use us, even though some of the times we are misunderstanding some of the main points. But, you know, love covers a multitude of sins. The truth, if, it's, if the truth is centered on Christ mainly, I may have things that, that you know, are a little bit de detracting, but it's me. And I think you are a vessel that God is using. And he uses you uh, with your weaknesses and with your foibles and also with the humor that you have uh, and some of the marks that are your distinctives. And it's funny, even quirks become, uh, become used by God uh, in odd ways. Uh, I have been imitated so many times <laughs> by people in my, in my life that uh, I realize that even Earl. that... Is not what bad. possible quirks could you have? <laughs> you know, there's one who knows all about them. <laughs> Here's another question. You know, I was really impressed uh, just to hear about your internship program and everything that you're doing for the next generation of pastors. So one question I have is, what do you see as being one of the biggest needs in the raising up of the next generation of pastors? And do you have any concerns about what you see in the state of the church today? Uh, I, I would love you to speak to this because I, I'm, I'm, high on the, I'm high on the young generation that are coming along now that, that I see and, have me, and meet. I know that this generation right now is, has been accused of being the instant gratification generation. I think that's a cheap shot. I do think this. This generation wants uh, something to happen. 
Now, if there's a, a weakness, they want it to happen immediately. <laughs> now, there's a lack of patience, but that's not a major mistake. But it is, I think, a mark of this generation that you want things because maybe uh, computer technology has lured you into that. You want things very quickly to happen. Uh, if I can give advice, take the long view. D develop a patient strategy. Uh, I like Hunter's book where he says, he gives the, the idea of a Christian being of, with faithful presence in the midst of the world. Faithful presence is taking the long view. And you know, hang it out, hang it, hang, hang it, hang it in. Stay a while. Don't quickly move. Stay put. Uh, I, you know, I've done that. I'm not making myself a great example, but I have stayed put in the places where I've been. Uh, and I've been very happy. I never really wanted to leave where I was at. I was always called away, but and I kind of wanted to be there. Uh, I went to Manila, and I made everybody got so sick of me saying that Manila is the most important city in the world today. And Dale Bruner, my friend, came over, and then we started to both say that, that we developed even a talk on the seven most important cities in the world. And of course, since we were both living in Manila, we made Manila one of the seven <laughs> most important cities in the world. Nobody else agreed with us, but we had fun doing it. And, but the fact is we believed in our place. We felt that we were supposed to be there, and we uh, zeroed in on, on where we were. Dale stayed there 10 years, I was there six years. But we just stayed there and stayed put. And I think with youth, that's very important to stay put. I love youth pastors that see youth as a great calling. In fact, I hate this. I'm going to start my ministry in youth, then I'll go on to a, a, another church. Uh, pediatrics isn't that way. A pediatrician <laughs> doesn't start in pediatrics and then go on into gerontology. <laughs> my daughter is a pediatrician. She's 50 years old, and she's a pediatrician. And thank God for that. And uh, so why should pastors think you should move on to the... Uh, Old folks, no, stay with, but on the other hand, if you have a gift with old folks, that's where you should be. But if, if you have a gift, like Steve obviously has, with youth and with this generation in middle school, stay put and, and invest and then watch what happens. Did you want to add something, Doug? I, I just wanted to add, and I want to kind of tell, tell on Earl, but I think one of the things that Earl has said to my generation and other generations, and he has said this, but he has lived it out, he has said, we need you, we need your voice, and we wanna give you a voice at the table. And if I could say something to the upcoming generation, let's all have that same spirit. We need this upcoming generation. We need them as a part of the discussion. We need their passion, we need their ideas, we need their questions, we need their anger, we need their frustrations. And I think we need each other. And we need each other to be able to figure out what is, what is this text saying, and how do we convey these age-old truths to a generation that has grown up with iPhones, because we haven't. And we need to know, how do we convey this? The, the truth is the same, the language. So we need each other. And I think if I could say, how do we make sure that there's a place at the table? Um, how do the young people make sure there's a place at the table for the older folks? How do the older folks make sure there's a place at the table for the younger folks? Earl, I want to thank you. You've done that. You've, you've said that, but you've done it with your life. And that's an inspiration. I hope that we can all do that. All right. Here's another question from Michelle. Hi. Um, I feel like we're talking a lot about bringing the scripture to folks in the church, but we live in a community that most of the people in the community don't want to come into a church. It's a very unchurched and very, uh, very not trusting of organized religion. Can you give any ideas about how to bribe <laughs> those folks to just have a chance to look at Scripture in a way they probably never had before? Yeah, well, look for Tyrannius Hall. You know, there may be that place that's neutral. See, Paul had a neutral place. That he, and we've tried to do that in Earl Palmer Ministry, which I'm now involved in, and that is we have the Kindling Muse that Dick Staub is the brains behind. And actually, he's had it for years at the Hale Brewery. And then he joined with us, and we called it the Kindling Muse at Earl Power Ministry. And we meet the first Monday of, for six months of the year at the... But we chose, as our location, the Walker Ames Room at the University of Washington, which is the <laughs> second floor of Kane Hall. And people come, and they park. They have to pay $10 to park on the university <laughs> campus. They come, and we... 
we take on, and that's when we do Bible studies and do the, the various presentations that we do. But it's neutral. And I think maybe you need to look for some neutral uh, places. Bible studies in restaurants are wonderful. Uh, and a lot of churches do that anyway, you know, where you have a Bible study group. Why not meet in a neutral place if they don't want to come to the church? Uh, I don't care where they're at. The key is, are they getting uh, a, a chance to make discovery of, of this eternal truth that you want them to make the discovery of? It may be at a golf club. It may be a, a lot of different places. Ladies and gentlemen, very excited to tell you that Shirley has a question. Oh, Shirley that? Palmer. I love it when she does it. And by the way, before she asks her question, she has put a lot of work into this today. And a number of you have asked me to make sure that she is acknowledged for that. So would you please give a big round of applause for Shirley Palmer? <laughs> and Dr. Palmer, what is your question? Well, actually, it's not a question, but... Um after 59 years, I feel like I've learned a lot from Earl. And uh, I just want to tell you a story in response to your last question, Michelle. And when we were in Berkeley, uh, our son was playing on a baseball team, and they were losing. Earl was the scorekeeper. They lost every single game the entire season. And he was there, just yay, yay, go on, and so forth. As you might have seen, he does have a lot of passion. And we had a new members class at First Press Berkeley, and this family came into the church, and each person shared what, what brought them into the church. And this family got up, and they said, well, we had a son on a baseball team, and Reverend Palmer was a scorekeeper, and the kids lost every single game the entire season. And he was so enthusiastic and brought so much energy and so po much positive and joy to what and we watched him so we said we had to go find out what was going on with this guy and they joined church so one of the things I've learned from Earl is he's not just in the church he is out there and we've discovered that um, in many many I've discovered that in many many different ways and I think sometimes it's not always about bringing people into the church it's about we in the church being out there in the community. So hey, thanks for letting me share that, Dick. I, um, I, I hesitate, but I just want to, I, I think that's such an important thing. And I've, I've learned through my own life and my own journey that it's, it's possible to get very cloistered. And it's really important to be out there. Earl was the chaplain for our son's football team in inner city. Um, uh, Richmond, California, and they never had a chaplain. And the kids came and asked Earl, or asked our son, if Earl would be the chaplain. And so our son said, "Ask him." So we would go to the football game, and uh, Rick Danner knows the place. He knows where those games took place at Kennedy High School on Cutting Boulevard. And there would be all the kids in a circle on their knees with their helmets on their side, praying. And the deputy director of the school district, where you don't mix God with anything in the school, said, you know, there's nothing I can do about that because the kids asked for it. And there would be Earl praying. And I would grant this, uh, to say this statement, that if Earl walked down the city in Richmond, California, and one of those football players, even now, because I saw it years later, saw him, they would say, hi, Pastor Palmer. So it's not just bringing them in, it's our going out. So I hope you don't mind me sharing that. 59 years I've lived with this guy. Yeah. Okay. 59 years, and her conclusion is, Earl Palmer is out there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Doug, for your response, and Earl is gonna make some concluding comments uh, now. Yeah, we are going to give a gift to you now. I mean, you may not think of it's a gift, but uh, I did write, I wrote a paper called uh, On Being a Biblical Christian. And it was, uh, it's been published, and we're, we didn't want to give it at the beginning because I didn't want anybody reading uh, that paper. You probably wouldn't anyway, but I didn't want you to do it during the class. Uh, so we're, my, my, my team uh, are going to pass it out. Hey, all these guys are so great. And you get it? 
and it's yours to have and keep. It's, a, it's an article I wrote on... I first published it, uh, an adaptation. This is an adap- adaptation. I changed this, of course, and tried to bring it up to the 21st century where we are now. But I first wrote it for a book called Biblical Authority uh, that was published. Uh, and so I wrote this as a chapter in that book. And then I decided to adapt it for today. Uh, anybody else want one? You get, you get it. It's yours. Uh, I want to thank Dick Staub for being here. I want to thank my, all of my responders. You guys have been just marvelous. It's been a wonderful day. We are, and I want to thank my wife, who she was the person that put everything together, all these name tags and everything. We assembled them in our house last night, and uh, she did the work, believe me. And, and, and Gray, my study assistant, just been a trooper. And this wonderful committee, we put their names down in the program. They worked so hard. And uh, we did the invitations uh, through them. And you were all, you got invitations by computer. So that we're trying to be in the new age. So that you could respond by computer. Could get your, even meals chosen by computer. And I think it worked. And, uh, you, and you were supposed to get a parking permit by computer. I hope that worked for you. But, you know, and with Seattle Pacific, I want to say thank you to Seattle Pacific. These, uh, uh, Jennifer and uh, uh, Lisa have just been <laughs> troopers. And so what, do I, what else do I say? Is we are just grateful for you all coming. I am very encouraged. Look at how young this group is. And, and we did have uh, the, a complete mix of ages and of walks of life and of ministries. Just think of the ministries that are represented in this room. It is totally inspiring. I want to thank John Harrison and his crew who filmed us because uh, we decided we wanted to try to save this uh, on film. And so thanks for everything. And then we have a final joy. Uh, and Steve Newby is, that, is the final joy. Uh, and then he'll lead us also in a final song. But uh, Steve, one of my friends down through the years, uh, I would love to speak whenever I got invited to speak, if I could, at SPU. Uh, it would be a joy, especially if Steve was going to sing and, uh, and lead the music. And Steve, but to now Steve's doing something more than singing for us. He is a scholar, as you know, and he has composed a song, but he's done it expositionally. And he's going to give us a little insight into that before you sing it to us. And then we'll sing together, right? This is my brother. I have a couple of tasks for you. This is probably going to take about seven minutes. But the passage that Earl shared with us, I begin to hear music on the Philippians passage. And I just like to give you an example of how, of how artists and composers work. One way to work with the biblical text and exegete it in a way where it makes sense musically. Would you drill down on that Philippian text again? Would you take that out? And meanwhile, is it possible to have maybe a, one person from the table just to come up and, and pick up this text? This is another passage in Mark, 30, Mark 13. So just about seven, seven more minutes here. Thank you. It's an honor to be able to serve here. But one line came out. Well, one word. You said secret. Everyone say secret. And there was something special with that. So while Pastor was teaching, I was taking notes. But as I was taking notes, I began to hear music as well. And encourage your music staff, your worship staff, to, to take notes in such a way, are they able to drill down with the homily, with the sermon, that they can connect and concentrate ideas?
take what they hear, take the ideas, put it in the process of imagination, I don't think we, we necessarily are creating enough music, new music, especially music for particular congregations. Repeat after me. I've learned the secret of my sanity. I've learned the secret of my sanity. I've had plenty. I've had plenty. And I've been in need. I've been in need. This one thing that I know for sure I can do all things through him. I can do all things through him. That strengthens me. So this idea of where you have a text, a certain text has a rhythm. When a preacher is, is exegeting the text and pulling out certain words, where there is a Greek translation, they'll give you the idea in Greek, I think artists, and I would encourage even preaching, teaching pastors who know a little bit of music, how does this Greek idea, using your imagination, how does it translate in rhythm, harmony, melody, counterpoint, and so on and so on? If, we, if we're going to the, to the root here, in Greek or Hebrew, what are the elements of music? A lot of times we sing certain things and the, and the musical elements don't necessarily instantiate the text. They don't make sense. It's like trying to force a poor illustration in a sermon. I want to give you an example now of how perhaps I can imagine what, what Pastor Earl said here. I really don't think that this idea of I've learned the secret of my sanity, it would sound like this. Secret. I don't know. I mean, maybe it all depends on your church experience. But perhaps, uh, I've learned the secret of my sanity. I've had plenty and been in need. Now, is need going to sound like this? Or is it going to sound like this? It's curious. Because only you and Jesus really know what that, all that has been plentiful and sometimes our deepest need. So look, focus on the truth, fully satisfied. So the whole idea of satisfied ends with a cadence. Our God will supply our every need. God will supply our every need. Uh, can you sing this? Our God will supply our every need. Our God will supply our every need. Our God will supply our every need. The whole notion of counterpoint is a way to musically exegete how we can take the text and serve a particular apologetic. How does a musical element point to a theological notion and a hermeneutical tool? I really don't think some folks are thinking like that. Handle it. When we listen to the Hamels 
Messiah. And how Hamlet executed the text in Isaiah. Come for ye, come for ye, my people. That's pretty comforting, isn't it? <laughs> say, say, go God, say, go God. Well, he was pretty powerful. He knew how to work with the voice, the particular testator of the tenor. And the strings are playing in this resonance in an open E major sound. Now, perhaps some of you, this might be very foreign as preaching pastors. How do you think musicians feel when they don't have a theological or hermeneutical tool? And you and you actually expect them, well, you know, they're just so spiritually immature. Perhaps we need a safe place. A place in the middle where musicians can learn the theological lexicon and the teaching pastors can learn the musical lexicon. And we can create and reimagine liturgies together in a new, different kind of way. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> there, 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 there's a book coming out. <laughs> I'll close with this. Uh, the book is how to worship outside the music box. I think it really challenges us how, how are we thinking about exegeting the text and doing something with the composition. And there's a lot of other things. But for our purposes now, when we look at this text in the book of Mark, Mark 13, 24, 37. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And then later on in the text, Jesus says, be on guard, keep awake. I wrote a little song about it, like to hear it. A darkened sun, a moonless night, the stars will fall, from heaven's side, the powers in heaven will be shaken. Be on guard, keep away. Now, all of a sudden, that feels kind of like rockish or jazz, but it grabs the attention. How will, how does one drill down with this text and create something new? I think you have to be an explorer of many musical genres. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with glory. And I deliberately created a glissando on the idea of stars falling and the Son of Man coming in the clouds. So there are musical elements that help lift up the big ideas in the text. Finally, when you see these things take place, the Lord is near. Now the idea of near in this chord, I'm actually playing, here's the chord, but I'm playing a second a minor second to instantiate the idea how close God is. Little elements like that help lift up the text. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Now here's, here's the hook at the very, very end. Be on guard. Keep awake. It's almost like a 007 kind of thing. The 
pink. Be on guard, keep awake. The servants charge until that day. Be on guard, keep awake. The servants charge until that day. Be on guard, keep away. Be on guard, keep away. Be on guard, keep away. Just an example of how one can lift up the text in a way and bring a different musical life to it so that people will really hear what the text is saying. Let's close and sing this together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, today and always. Amen. <laughs>